You know, there we go. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan Rutter. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Parent Engagement at Claremont <clears throat> McKenna College, also an alumnus of CMC. Um, it's a pleasure to have all of you here. I hope wherever you are, you're safe, you're healthy, your families are doing well. Um, I know this is a very trying time for everyone. Hopefully it will end uh, and we will be able to meet again in person around the globe on campus. Uh, and we'll see you at your reunions or family weekend or whatever it may be uh, in the near future. Uh, today, I'm very excited to welcome uh, Professor George Thomas, who is the, uh, the Burnett C. Wolford Professor um, of uh, Political Institutions here at, uh, at CMC. He's also um, the uh, director of the Salvatore Center for the Study of Individual Freedom in the Modern World, which is the original, the first uh, institute founded at Claremont McKenna College. So an absolute thrill to have Professor Thomas here, but of course also um, the Salvatore Center so well represented uh, as well. And today's talk, unbelievably apropos when we think about uh, politics, we think about um, freedom of speech, and of course CMC has focused a lot on the Open Academy Initiative recently, which is about bringing diverse viewpoints, both faculty and students, to the classroom and creating productive dialogue. Uh, many of you are probably aware that there's a lot of issues out there where uh, one side may be dominant over another, whether it's in the news, whether it's in higher education, whether it's in business, uh, and CMC is continuing to do whatever it, we can to preserve that, that CMC core uh, essence of viewpoint diversity, of political diversity, making sure our classrooms have um, uh, both sides represented, both from faculty and students. So I encourage you to really uh, soak it all in from Professor Thomas. He's gonna talk for a little bit. We'll do some Q&A towards the end. Um, if uh, you're unfamiliar with Zoom at the bottom, you can open up the uh, chat feature uh, and you can put your name and class year there. You can also put a question in there and I'll, I'm happy to ask it on your behalf. You can also on the participant area, if you click on that, uh, the participants will pop up to the right. There's a feature there called raise hand. If you click that raise hand feature, uh, I will um, call on you and you can actually uh, ask your question uh, directly to uh, Professor Thomas. So uh, with that, I hand it over uh, uh, to you, sir. Hey, well, thank you guys all so much um, for coming out. Um, I was, you know, delighted when Evan asked me to do this. Uh, I, I guess I should say it's, I, I don't like the fact that this is starting to seem somewhat routine. Um, I, you know, we've been doing our classes like this and it's become a little bit more comfortable. Um, I certainly hope that this isn't the future that, that uh, you know, we get to see everyone in person uh, again soon. Um, hopefully this fall, I'm still crossing my fingers on that. But anyway, today I, I thought I would talk about something that is um, both old, but then um, I think, you know, probably has lessons for us in the current day, and that's uh, the early construction of free speech. And I deliberately want to use the title Constructing Free Speech, because I think this is an episode that, while it's well known in constitutional circles, it's actually passed over uh, and glossed over uh, far too quickly. It's the, the importance of what occurred in the 1790s with regard to how we think about freedom of speech, which was really linked to how we think about political parties and how we think even more deeply about popular government generally uh, is something that I think we don't attend to carefully enough. And, and while I don't wanna say, okay, there are some really kind of clear parallels and lessons um, for contemporary politics today, I do think revisiting the episode is helpful in thinking about constitutional government as a form of popular government and what kind of citizenry is necessary for that. Um, but also what kind of politics in terms of engaging in political parties uh, and most importantly, freedom of speech and, the, and freedom of the press um, from what I want to focus on today. So I also want to invite you, I know that I'm going to try to keep it to about 30 minutes um, or so to leave a lot of time for discussion afterward, but I'm also happy to kind of field questions as we go and have maybe a little bit more uh, of a discussion along the way. That's normally how classes run. Um, that might be a little more difficult to do with this larger group by way of Zoom. Um, but if you do have questions uh, before I'm formally done, please um, you know, raise your hand and, and uh, Evan or Jenna uh, will let you in um, and we can you know, feel them maybe as we go. But I want to begin just quickly with the Sedition Act. Now it might surprise you to know, if you don't know, that less than a decade after the First Amendment was ratified, Congress passed and President John Adams signed into law the Sedition Act of 1798. 
Now, purportedly, the Federalists and uh, President Adams were concerned about being drawn into war, and they were worried about agitation against the government uh, in general. Uh, but the act made it a crime to write or speak, and now I'm quoting the act, false, scandalous, and malicious writings against the government with the intent to defame it or to bring it into contempt or disrepute. The question immediately was, was this consistent with the First Amendment's command, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press? The debate that ensued was a debate about what the freedom of speech and press entailed, but it was inseparable from what sort of government the written constitution had brought into being. Now, it might surprise you as well to learn, if you're not familiar with constitutional history, that the Sedition Act was widely viewed by Federalists at the time, although this is, it's, it, I'm not gonna get bogged down in this, it's actually a little more complex. Federalists kind of spread across the board and the Republicans, um, Jeffersonians as they're often called, um, also had some diversity. So we can take that maybe in the questions, but Federalists on the whole argued that freedom of speech and freedom of the press under the First Amendment simply replicated the common law understanding that we'd inherited from the United Kingdom. And that was that while the government could not prohibit speech up front, that is, it couldn't engage in prior restraint, it was perfectly acceptable for the government to punish speech, including speech that harmed the government's reputation after the fact. So it prohibited censorship beforehand, but allowed for punishment of speech after the fact. Now, critics of the Sedition Act, James Madison being a leading one, but I'll talk about several other characters who I'm sure are much less familiar, argued that the very idea of seditious libel, that is a, a essentially libel against the government, was at odds with the American Constitution. And their argument, and this, is, and this is where I want to deliberately again emphasize this notion of constructing freedom of speech, because they were really in the process of working uh, this out. It was a really new form of government and a novel form of government, an experiment, as Alexander Hamilton famously called it in the first Federalist paper. And in this new form of government, uh, critics of the Sedition Act argued that freedom of speech took on a new place and new meaning in the constitutional order, that we could not accept the inherited ideas uh, from the common law. Uh, but to understand this and to understand then how free speech fit in the American scheme, we need to understand the revolution in government that the American Constitution, really beginning with the Declaration of Independence, brought about. And the crux of the argument was really quite simple. In the American system, power flows from the people, which requires a robust conception of freedom of speech, allowing the people, who after all are the popular sovereign, to criticize the government. And it's the government that's bound by the Constitution. Now, as I said, while we have come to accept this understanding today, I think we too quickly gloss over its importance. Right? So in the late years of the 18th century, even after the passage of the First, First Amendment, we were really working out what the freedom of speech entailed. And the Sedition Act confronted us with this question. And it was also a question that was linked to the idea of political parties, and especially the idea that you could have a party that was out of power, loyal to the Constitution and the political order itself, and yet critical of the government in power. I mean, one of the things that really can't be overemphasized here is that the, the idea that you could separate the Constitution from the particular government in power was really quite novel at the time, right? I mean, so that it was one thing to criticize President John Adams and another thing to be trying to sabotage the constitutional order itself. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight in working through this, and I hope this comes out uh, as I go through some of the Sedition Act trials, which is really what I wanna focus on um, in bringing out the arguments against the Sedition Act, is that the Sedition Act occurred, the arguments about it occurred in what was often uh, called in the day, out of doors. All that really means is this was a debate that occurred in civil society. It was a debate between ordinary citizens, the press, and people. It wasn't a debate that was limited to um, governmental institutions or people within uh, the government itself. And we tend to conflate the protection of the Constitution with the judiciary and especially the Supreme Court. I don't want to downplay uh, 
Um, that is their importance, obviously. Uh, but we tend to assume that courts take the leading role in protecting the Constitution. But history is actually much more complicated than that. The response to the Sedition Act and th the construction of free speech that goes along with it was largely done, as I said, outside of formal channels of government and often by ordinary citizens. I mean, not just ordinary citizens, um, but many of them were, you know, journalists, uh, newspaper editors, and the like. So it was done by concerned citizens, both through political institutions like state legislatures, uh, but also out of political institutions by way of newspapers, informal public forums, and societies that were organized to criticize it. Uh, and simply by engaging one another as citizens. And so I guess one of the things I want to think about in current terms is that maintaining constitutional government really depends on a citizenry that carries the constitutional project, the American experiment forward uh, based on the values that they hold. And I mean, I think that's something as you know, the question of popular government is maybe more open uh, both at home and abroad than it has been at any time since the Great Depression uh, or World War II. All right, so kind of you know setting that uh, setting the stage in that way. Let me uh, quickly turn to just to set up the critique of the, the Sedition Act, the Federalists' arguments for why uh, the Sedition Act was consistent with their understanding of freedom of speech. So the Federalists at the time, and again I'm using the terms kind of loosely because there were Federalists. James Wilson, who sat on the Supreme Court, was probably. Uh, the second most important only to James Madison at the Constitutional Convention, um, was, a, was a leading Federalist, but deeply critical of the Sedition Act of 1798. So there, you know, it's kind of a, an open period in that regard. And the Federalist Party itself, again, not to get too bogged down in particulars, but the Federalist Party itself was kind of transforming throughout the 1790s. And there was a real question of um, democracy against aristocracy, as it was called at the times with Republicans and Jeffersonians insisting that they spoke for ordinary folks uh, and Federalists somewhat skeptical um, that ordinary folks should have this much say in government. But Federalists were uneasy with some of the popular criticism of government and especially the idea of a legitimate and organized opposition to the sitting government in power. And they worried that such conspiracies might undermine or overthrow the government. And so they argued that to defame the government itself was an act of treason not protected by the First Amendment. So for instance, Charles Dana, a Federalist from Massachusetts, argued that a license to injure others or the government by pulmonies and in, with impunity um, was inconsistent with their understanding of freedom of speech. So just to be clear, the, this left the British common law of seditious libel in place. Now, all that really means is that freedom of speech prohibited the government from requiring that you get prior approval before publishing, writing, or speaking. But once you had spoken, you could be punished for your speech if it libeled um, the government. And libel was really the equivalent in this case of defaming or bringing the government into disrepute. Now, Here's a really curious wrinkle. In the British understanding, it did not matter if you argued that truth was a defense. That is, the statements I'm saying are in fact true. Because right? if you said these things and they were true, under the common law, that made your libel, that is your defaming of the person, right, the governmental official or the government itself, all the more powerful. So truth was not a defense. Now the wrinkle, is that under the Sedition Act of 1798, truth was a defense. You could say, okay, if the things I'm saying are in fact true, then I can't be prosecuted for them. Now, as we'll see to critics of the act, that didn't matter at all. And it's not clear that it really did. So let me turn to some of the arguments in the newspapers um, from the 1790s that led to some of the uh, early and first prosecutions, right? Before I get there, I, I, what I want to put forward by the, the critics of the act, so those who were really engaged, I think, in constructing our modern understanding of freedom of speech, um, is that 
popular government not only requires this, but the fact that truth is a defense doesn't really matter because their worry was that this would ultimately have the effect of criminalizing differences of political opinion. So, for instance, James Madison, who would uh, get the Virginia legislature to write um, a, a uh, critical piece, the Virginia resolutions, critical of uh, the Sedition Act, arguing that they were unconstitutional and inconsistent with popular government, also would write a lengthy report defending uh, the Virginia resolutions. And these Virginia resolutions, just to give you an idea of how this de debate played out over civil society, the Virginia resolutions were passed in Virginia. Then they were sent to all of the state legislatures. They were also then sent to all members uh, of the House of Representatives and all members of the Senate. And, they, and then they were published in newspapers. And the urge was to repeal the Sedition Act as unconstitutional. And so as part of that, they argued that here's why it's unconstitutional. So for Madison, um, the argument was that it would, it would ultimately inhibit our discussion of public affairs. And Madison argued that we're gonna disagree about politics and policy, but we've got to, because this is a popular government, be able to criticize public officials with whom we disagree. And our disagreements rooted in our political opinions must include efforts that may well defame public officials, bring those public officials into disrepute. Because to defame a public official was an inescapable feature of popular politics if you disagreed um, with that official. And so their argument was that there was no real easy way to separate facts from opinions in this case. So look, let me just give you a few quick examples of publications at the time. Um, and you know, if you think that the press um, and our political dialogue couldn't get worse, um, you can look to the 1790s and think that it maybe could get a little bit worse. So here was a Republican newspaper writing about President John Adams. Um, they called him thin-skinned and pompous, that he wanted his to be called his majesty. Um, and this from a man who insisted uh, by, way of, by way of the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, that we are a government of laws and not of men. Um, and so, when you think of the papers at the time, Adams was called um, in his Republican paper, a libeler whose hands were reeking with the blood of the poor friendless Connecticut sailor. He was also a liar whose office was a scene of prolificacy and usury, as well as a hoary headed incendiary whose purpose was to embroil this country in a war with France. It's fairly harsh stuff and Adams was thin skinned and you can actually, you know, when you look back at the founding era, lots of presidents um, look like they'd have a hard time fitting into contemporary politics. I think you could imagine John Adams actually tweeting. Um, I mean, he'd probably be tweeting at every critic um, that was around at the time. I mean, his biggest problem was, and this is a guy who wrote volumes, he couldn't keep himself to the, you know, the 140 characters, or is it now 280 characters um, on Twitter. Now, the, the catch is, while there are obvious you know, there's invective here and, uh, you, know, you know, fairly uncivil dialogue, there are really substantive claims here. For instance, the poor friendless Connecticut sailor that Adam's, uh, you know, hands are bloody with was actually a real debate. It was a debate at the time um, over Adam's action of turning over a, a uh, uh, gentleman who, Adams insisted was a British sailor who had escaped uh, his service in the British Navy, right? Republicans insisted he was an American citizen who the British had illegally impressed into service in the British Navy. So there was a dispute. Was this a British sailor properly turned over to the British uh, Navy or was this an American citizen who was illegally impressed into service in the British Navy? That's the kind of argument that we needed to have. Now, while you could say that um, the Republican speech or criticism Adams was over the top in ways, the Republican point was that they did view Adams as somebody whose hands were reeking with the blood um, of this sailor because he had, in violation of the laws and constitutions, not given this potential citizen um, due process rights, but in fact just turned him over 
to the British, right, as an executive act. Uh, Republicans thought Adams was doing this to curry favor with the British and unconstitutionally slighting the rights of an American citizen. Or you could say um, Republicans thought that Adams was stubbornly set at war with France. Uh, Republicans looked to France as a potential ally. Uh, so not only did they support the American Revolution, uh, but America really relied on French aid at the time. I mean, so even again, though, there's you know lots of invective sorting out the opinions and political opinions from the criticism is a difficult business, the Republicans argued, and the Sedition Act would allow um, those who engaged in this kind of rhetoric to be silenced, to be fined and jailed for their political commentary. Now, Federalists also engaged in this sort of invective. Um, for instance, a leading Federalist journalist referred to Jeffersonian Republicans as the refuse of nations and frog-eating man-eating, blood-drinking cannibals. Now, I mean, is any of this true? You could say, all right, so maybe some of it is. Um, there probably was a little bit true um, in it, or at least one could see where they were going with some of these opinions. I mean, so for instance, again, serious substantive issues underlie um, this sort of uncivil invective. Um, why were the Republicans blood-drinking cannibals? Um, you know, maybe it's because, or why were they frog eating? These probably go together. They were supporters of the French Revolution at the time. And as supporters of the French, um, there was a real worry that they were supporting a kind of radicalism, a, you know, not just the frog eating with the French, but a radicalism that was, in fact, embracing a revolutionary move, movement that, from Federalists' eyes, was devouring all who opposed it. Um, probably the man-eating. What about the refuse of nations? Republicans um, were welcoming aliens from all sorts. Um, they were welcoming not just the Irish at the time, and several of the editors actually are going to be Irish, um, but they were, they, were they were welcoming French and others who Federalists worried wouldn't be good Americans. They would not be good American citizens. And so there again are real substantive issues underlying the kind of uncivil discourse, and that's what we want to um, try to draw out. So in thinking about that, let me just quickly turn to a couple of the trials, because I think that's where some of the most interesting defenses of freedom of speech come out. And again, they come out really um, by name, by the names of people you haven't heard of, but who are really essential to forging our modern understanding of freedom of speech. So take Thomas Cooper. Thomas Cooper was prosecuted under the Sedition Act, and, and the prosecution actually, to, to think of the day, actually occurred by way largely of the Secretary of State, who sat with the judges at several of these trials. I mean, so it doesn't look like the kind of due process we would insist upon um, today. But the Secretary of State was the one actively engaged in the prosecution of um, these critics of the government and of John Adams. But Thomas Cooper was a newspaper editor. Uh, and he was prosecuted for his criticisms of John Adams. Um, and his, his presiding over his trial was uh, Justice Samuel Chase, who was a Supreme Court justice, but at the time, Supreme Court justice is actually something that probably violates the Constitution, and they did it for um, most of the 19th century. They actually sat um, on lower courts as well, and so at the time, they actually sat as trial judges um, as well. Uh, even though they would could later on hear their own cases on appeal, which raises the real constitutional issues. But at his um, trial, Cooper argued that he was being prosecuted for simple criticism of John Adams. So for instance, Cooper wrote that President Adams was intent on aggrandizing executive power. And he said this included, and he pointed at the Sedition Act, restricting the liberty of speech and liberty of the press, um, as well as multiplying laws against libel and sedition. He also insisted that Adams was attempting uh, to enforce doctrines of confidence in the executive so that Adams was prosecuting people or, or insisting on the prosecution of people simply because they were critical of him. He said this was at odds with the liberty of the press and freedom of speech. And to, in his own defense at the time, Cooper argued that he was pointing to the public acts 
of John Adams, which he said, look, this includes building a Navy and a standing army and borrowing money. And Cooper then went on to compare and contrast Adams' actions with those of George Washington uh, in an unflattering way. And Cooper then doubted Adams' capacity to be president. At his trial, I mean, Cooper put this sort of perfectly. He said, look, the country's divided and almost equally divided into two grand parties. And then he proceeded to kind of illuminate the differences between these parties. And for our purposes, it really said, he said, it comes down to um, one party, the Federalists, think that the liberties of the country are endangered by the licentiousness of the press. The other party, the Republicans or Jeffersonians, think that it's endangered by the restrictions of the president on freedom of speech and the press. Um, but when Cooper went to argue that truth was a defense at his trial, Justice Chase denied him any ability to kind of muster and find facts and say, well, here are the facts before us to support my contentions. And I mean, and notice again, just like the kind of invective we saw with frog eating, man drinking um, cannibals, um, Cooper's is tame compared to um, that sort of invective. But uh, I mean, Cooper himself is arguing that I'm pointing to Adams's public acts and in pointing to his public acts, I am then constructing my own political opinions based upon them. So when I see Adams trying to silence speech or when I see him raising um, a standing army or taxing people um, for a possible war with France, I think he is attempting to concentrate power in a way that's detrimental to Republican government. And I am attempting to essentially defame Adams, but Cooper's point was he wanted to defame Adams' public acts, not his personal behavior, right? And he said, I do so without malicious intent, right? Rather, the intent for Cooper was to highlight political disagreement about public issues, which he called the essence of Republican government. And it is, it is uh, you know, plea to the jury. He argued that he, he said, I cannot help thinking they, the government, would have been better confuted, that is his arguments, by evidence and argument rather than by indictment. But neither the justice presiding, Chase, or the prosecution bought it. They, in fact, made an argument that we need to take uh, seriously because it highlights the, the whole idea being worked out of what is popular government with popular elections and what does that mean for those who are, again, claiming to be loyal to the government, but critical, loyal to that is the political order and constitution, that part of the government, but critical of the actual administration in power, right? So for instance, Chase at the trial lectured, not just Cooper, but the jury and said, once you've had an election, the minority, that is those who are on the losing side, must surrender up their judgment. Chase even went so far as to argue that private opinion must give way to public judgment, or that'll be the end of government. So only those who were now elected and in power were really able to have opinions on the matters before us. The public that lost in Chase's eyes had to acquiesce to that. Right, then the question was, well, how do you have an election? And the interesting part is that Cooper's actually writing to influence the election of 1800. And he tries to point that out, but he's silenced not just by Chase on that, but the prosecutor at the time says that that's not his place, right? So for instance, the prosecutor argues um, at, the, at Cooper's trial, given his criticisms Adams, he says, it is no less than to call into decision whether Thomas Cooper, the defendant, or the president of the United States, to whom this country has thought proper to confide its most important interests, is best qualified to judge whether the measures adopted by our government are calculated to preserve the peace and promote the happiness of America. So the prosecution, right, making this argument defending the Sedition Act, essentially said, that Cooper is in no position to criticize John Adams. John Adams, after all, is president. As president, we've got to respect Adams's opinions. Um, Cooper's just some guy off the street. We have no business uh, having him criticize President Adams at the time. Um, and so Cooper is found guilty 
and he's fined uh, $400 and sentenced to six months in prison. I won't go on about all the trials, but for instance, James Callender was also prosecuted. Um, he's the guy who wrote that Adams was a hoary-headed hoary -headed incendiary uh, intent on war um, with France. Callender also made the same kinds of arguments about freedom of speech uh, and the ability of the ordinary citizenry to criticize the government in power. Now, what's crucial here is that neither Callender nor Cooper were being prosecuted for making up statements about Adams' private life. There was not, not you know, a personal attack. There weren't engagements about or you know, disinformation about sex scandals and the like. These were all prosecutions based upon criticism of the administration's public acts, right? And that Callender and Cooper and others could point to and say, here are the facts that I think lead to this reasonable deduction. So I think that Adams is harmful because you know, he's done these three things. And I'm pointing to those th three things and saying that that gives us reason to be critical of him. Now, um, this kind of argument took place elsewhere um, besides with newspaper editors. For instance, Matthew Lyon, who was a fairly recent immigrant um, from Ireland, was a representative from Vermont. He was actually the first person prosecuted under the Sedition Act, which, which occurred even before, say, Madison helped draft the Virginia resolutions or that those were sent to other states. And he was, criticism, he, was, he was prosecuted for saying that Adams was grasping at power and intent on a quasi-war um, with, with France. And he accused Adams of unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp and foolish adulation. Now, you should remind yourself that President Adams thought he should be called His Majesty. Um, His Highness was not even elevated enough um, for him at the time. And yet Lyon was prosecuted for these sorts of um, statements, statements that he made as a member of the House of Representatives in criticizing the Sedition Act itself. Uh, he did go so far as to wonder whether Adams ought to be put in the madhouse. This was after he was um, being prosecuted. So at his trial, again, Lyon defended himself, arguing that the act was unconstitutional because it criminalized political opinions, but he also sought to demonstrate the truth of his opinions, right? I mean, and that's where um, the Republicans argued that we're going to have to allow kind of wide latitude for political debate because we're going to profoundly disagree. And even if we can agree on the same facts, we're going to disagree on what kind of political opinions we should then reach based upon those set of facts. Now, um, Lyon was also found guilty. He was fined $1,000 and sentenced, which was a substantial sum of money at the time, and sentenced to four months in prison. The upside is he was actually reelected um, from his jail cell um, and released to a celebratory crowd uh, and was charged again, um, but somehow he eluded prosecution. Now, I mean, these are just some of the highlights of the prosecutions under the Sedition Act. There were also others who were prosecuted for raising a liberty pole, which actually had been um, you know, very popular during the, the Revolutionary War, around the Declaration of Independence and the like. And the Liberty Poll in one instance in Massachusetts said, liberty and equality, downfall to the tyrants of America, peace and retirement to the president, long live the vice president uh, and the minority. Nevertheless, they were prosecuted at the time. Now, um, even sober, rhetoric, really sober and civil rhetoric. Uh, for instance, Albert Gallatin, who was also a member of the House of Representatives, was prosecuted under the Sedition Act. And he was, you know, he was prosecuted or, you know, at least initially prosecuted because he said in the House of Representatives that the Sedition Act was a violation of the Constitution, that it had not been intended for the public good, but solely for the party and purposes um, in power. That is, it was meant to suit Adams and his administration, um, that it wasn't for the good uh, of the country. Even that level of criticism, mild and moderate as it was, could get you prosecuted under the Sedition Act. So um, kind of having surveyed that, let me draw, I think, a couple of 
quick conclusions from that and then open it up um, to discussion. I mean, the, the most important one was for Republicans, um, not just these editors of newspapers and Madison and the representatives like Lyon, um, but for the citizens they represented, the point was that truth was not a defense because it would still allow you to prosecute, as we can see, political opinions and differences over political opinions. I mean, the argument really was that it criminalized differences of political opinion. Now, um, the other important thing to really draw out of this is that this construction of freedom of speech um, was really a serious break with inherited forms of government from the past. That is especially under the British system. I mean, so we, and, and Madison was especially good at this, and we can talk about it um, in the Q&A, with, with regard to the Virginia report and his defense of the Virginia resolutions criticizing the Sedition Act. And that was that when you think about popular government, and if you take the idea that the people are ultimately sovereign, you have to allow the people to engage in an evaluation of their public officials. They've got to subject them to what Madison called the merits and demerits um, of public trust. And part of popular government then may well mean that you're allowing the citizenry to criticize the government in a way that is meant to defame the government. Again, not the constitutional order itself, but the government in power, those who hold political power um, at the time. He said, you know, the Sedition Act belonged to the British common law understanding and really a kind of aristocratic or monarchical system where the people themselves weren't in power. So when you think um, of that understanding, I think it's really linked to the idea of creating not just a robust political debate that acknowledges profound disagreement um, within civil society, but says that that kind of disagreement isn't going to go away, right? I mean, so we're going to have to provide for it and provide for it in a way where ordinary citizens can not just engage one another across differences of opinion, but can engage the government um, in that way. Now, I mean, one of the things, again, I noted at the beginning and I want to really highlight is, I mean, this was, this was really a construction of free speech that was certainly led by, you know, figures like a James Madison, um, but it was also really by ordinary citizens, ordinary citizens who were arguing for their place within popular government, right? And saying that in a way, this, this idea was a very much a remnant of a monarchical kind of government rather than the Repu small r Republican government um, we had brought into being. Now, having said that and defended it, I mean, I think the you know, challenge for us is one, to think, okay, so when we turn to our own day, how do we think not just about freedom of speech um, and the press and the citizenry, because you, know, you could make arguments and, and the Federalists have some powerful points, along with freedom of speech should come some form of real responsibility. Um, and, and, you know, think of our problems today with regard to freedom of speech. They're often about um, the fact that there's so much disinformation um, out there. How do we really deal with that? How do we engage in that? How do citizens learn to understand and evaluate that um, so that they can be the engine of popular government? And, you know, there, you know, one thing to think about, I'll just kind of put it out there and that Madison wrestled with a lot is the kind of civic education that needs to go along with Republican government and freedom of speech and the like. And that's something um, we can touch on. But I think, you know, our challenges are uh, somewhat similar in terms of thinking about, you know, what the role of the people in government today and you know what place freedom of speech plays. But I think the, the other part, that, and this is the part again that I think we kind of pass over all too quickly, and that's that part of this was really working out what it meant to allow for profound disagreement and yet accept um, that we're all share some sort of set political principles, right? I mean, because what we're really saying is, we can all agree to some set of basic constitutional or Republican principles, and yet disagree profoundly within the terms of those principles and distinguishing then the difference between um, creating a Republican government or popular government or constitutional system, and then allowing for disagreement within 
that system. And I think that's something that we really maybe think more deeply about today because, I mean, you know, much like the 1790s, we seem to increasingly um, be headed toward a place where we basically don't trust the other party. We think that they're, it's not that we disagree with them, I think it's that we think that they are illegitimate. Um, and what was so important about the 1790s is working out that you can be disagreeing with the government in power, but not necessarily think that they're illegitimate, right? I mean, we, we maybe underplay the, what's called the Revolution of 1800, and that, and that comes out of uh, the criticism of the Sedition Act of 1798, where Jefferson actually does win the presidency, and he pardons um, those who were found guilty um, under, and the government later on actually pays back the fines um, that it issued on these people, recognizing that it, that was inconsistent with a Republican understanding of, small r Republican understanding of freedom of speech. But what we downplay is that was really the first peaceful transfer of power in history, where one party stepped down and allowed another party um, to take its place, right? And that's part of the debate here. And so I guess, you know, I'll, I'll kind of end with an open question there. Um, you know, can we really allow uh, the kind of government we've, uh, you know, cherished for centuries to go forward if we really view our fellow citizens um, not just as, you know, misguided or wrong, um, but as illegitimate and the other political party as um, illegitimate? So I'll end uh, on that note and, you know, we can Thank open you. it for questions and discussion. <clears throat> so Ben Turner is the first to raise his hand. So Ben, the floor is yours. You have to unmute, Ben. I know. I just I just got the prompt. How are you doing, Professor Thomas? Not bad. How are you? Good. Um, so my question is sort of rooted in the the distinction you made between sort of the British conception of common law, sort of freedom of speech, and now the modern conception of American freedom of speech. And as I understand it, in the UK, if you are accused of libel, the onus is often on like if it's a journalist or an individual, they're often the ones that have to go through the court case with the burden of proof for them to prove as opposed to the standard bearer being like the, the insulted party. So I've read and understand that many journalists have a hard time in the UK writing things that are particularly critical if they can't very accurately and I guess relatively quickly if they're going through a legal battle, criticize someone or potentially defame or libel them. Can you talk about kind of how maybe that came to be and how the modern conception of British libel differs so much from the American, given they kept the monarchy and have a parliamentary system, and then the American system evolved in such that distinct way? Say, I don't, I didn't totally follow the question at the end. I, I mean, I, you, I mean, certainly the, the certainly the part about um, the onus often being on the critic um, with regard to public officials is right in England, and, and they, and in the UK, there is a much less robust, I mean, there's still a pretty robust notion of freedom of speech, but it's much less robust than um, its American form. I mean, just one small catch that's just to be clear about the American system, when it comes to libel, defamation, and the like, and, and this really comes out of the Sedition Act, there's a, there's a profound difference when you think about freedom of speech in the press, when you're talking about public officials and public issues, right? right? Um, that's very different than private person. So the idea is you're going to have to allow for kind of a wider latitude in potential misstatements about them than you would for a private citizen um, who's not injected themselves into the public sphere who, right, you're not, I mean, because it really is about trying to hold the government accountable and responsible. Uh, and that's very different with a private citizen. Uh, but, but so there, there's, but there remain real differences between the British and American understanding. But, but the question right at the end, I didn't, I kind of lost. The yeah, point. that you basically, you already kind of like answered it. It's just sort of how do we, how do, how does the British system evolve out of something that didn't have as many of the founding fathers talking about that idea of a critical criticism of government and just kind of where it stands today as being, again, you know, like from a Commonwealth system originally, but then like, I don't know, like, I, I know that there are journalists that basically will write um, something that's maybe critical of government in the States or in Britain, and how might that differ in their understanding of what their expectation of their freedom to speak about those issues might be. So yeah, Britain and America are you, different. You, I, think you, I think you said it, so. Okay. It's good. <laughs> 
That's great. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. All right. John McDowell, I know you had a question in there, but you could, it was kind of answered. Do you want to yeah, okay. ask anything? Sure. I'll, I'll maybe follow up. So I guess my real question was, in the time you were talking about, uh, the country was, it seemed to be, the way you're talking, you know, about half divided on the understanding of freedom of speech. And the uh, one side controlled the levers of government, controlled the courts, controlled that sort of thing. So how were we able to move then from that situation um, to now our modern understanding uh, where we seem to be all in agreement or mostly in agreement about, about what that means? How are, we, how, how are we able to kind of flip that whole script, so to speak, in a, across a broad range of the people who are in the country? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, you know, re Republicans at the time uh, like to think that, you know, they made the case so powerful and persuasive and with, you know, ordinary citizens that they were, and they, I mean, the, and they argued really at the time that, you know, they were the majority really. Um, and that, that, that's why they prevailed in the election of 1800. And that's why then that understanding uh, became rooted. I mean, I, I, that's a little easy on their part. I don't think it, it's not quite so neat. And it's, I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it does, I mean, part of it is that, that Jefferson wins and Jefferson's understanding is just much more robust um, than the Federalists. And, and again, the, you know, the Federalists are, are a fairly diverse bunch and you do, and you have like a James Wilson and others who are Federalists who are, who accept a um, very broad notion of freedom of speech. And, and again, somebody like Madison, James Madison starts out, you know, you would have called him a Federalist when he's, he actually writes the Federalist with Hamilton, um, right? I mean, and so he starts out as a Federalist and um, has this very robust notion of freedom of speech and, uh, you know, pushes that forward. And uh, I, I think in that way, the, what really happens is the Adams administration, right? I mean, if you've, if you've seen Hamilton um, or heard Hamilton, right, the musical, that, that, you know, when you think about John Adams kind of taking an odd turn, it, they, there, there, is an, there is even a divide between what are called high federalists and low federalists. And, you know, Adams, you know, does go a little bit crazy. Um, he's just too thin skinned probably to be president. And you have a couple of others there and they're really worried about revolution. But what I think it's that this really is a genuine minority um, over time. And so that, you know, in, in by the 17, late 1798, 99, 1800, 1801, it's really a shrinking party. And in some sense, the Federalists of that order really kind of disappear. Um, and the more moderate Federalists, um, John Quincy Adams, for instance, Adams's son, um, migrate to the Republican Party. Um, and, and so, I you know, in that sense, it really is kind of, at least in part, a triumph of popular government. Um, there and the understanding of the people. I mean, the catch is free speech, um, you know, it like ebbs and flows from then because you have these great notions from early on, but then you get, uh, you know, the, the serious prosecution by progressives during World War I, where, I mean, really there are people who are, I mean, they are simply criticizing World War I and America's involvement and yet are jailed for it. So it's not like they go away, right? I mean, I think that, I mean, that's the emphasis on, you know, this is something that needs to be continually nurtured. I, I would say one other thing that's really interesting here that, that I didn't say at the outset, but that I think actually fits, um, fits CMC very well, I think in the Open Academy, and that's that the, the figure is working out freedom of speech in interesting ways, especially in Madison, but a Jefferson as well. This is also going on with educational institutions at the time, right? Because the, I mean, they're really thinking about what is what is education look like under this Republican form of government and that it's gotta be very different than under these older forms of government. And part of it is it's gotta have wide latitude for freedom of mind. And so you get um, both Madison and Jefferson really thinking about this carefully with the founding of the University of Virginia, which allows much more in the way of open debate and exchange um, you know, across the political spectrum, so to speak, than earlier understanding. And so, so for instance, when Madison is working out that curriculum, he argues it's got to include Federalists and Republicans, right? I mean, that that's the debate. And so you have to have that debate within the university. And it's that kind of debate that, and that's going to facilitate the broader um, debate within the public 
sphere. All right, we're turning to Brian Davidson. Brian. Hi there, thank you. Thanks, George, uh, for a really hey, <laughs> talk. Good to see you. Um, so I, my question, and I may be making too much of, a, a, putting too much important on, on the distinction you drew towards the beginning of your talk, so correct me if I'm reading too much into this, but um, you talked about how it was new, it was, you know, it was a new conception really to have, you know, a party in power, but then a separate party that was not in power, but was still loyal to the constitutional order. Um, so my question then is, was there, was there at the time, and really has there really ever been, an understanding of free speech that incorporates speech that is disloyal to the constitutional order? Um, I mean, I can imagine some radicals of the time certainly would have thought that way. Um, but generally, if you, as you look at history, I mean, that's, that's even under more permissive free speech regimes, that's been a, 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 a tough point, as you mentioned, with the, in the progressive era, red scares, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, that, no, that's a great question. And, um, you know, that, I mean, that's one that's, that I would say is, uh, you know, not wholly worked out during the 1790s. I mean, that you're, that you're, you're really talking about um, speech within, within a, you know, certain political order, a set of institutions and not, I mean, so, you know, that their argument is we're not seditious, um, Right, that the that it's the government itself that's being um, disloyal, so to speak, to um, the First Amendment and and the Republican scheme of government and the Constitution. I mean, but where you get inklings of it, right, is that that um, from you get it from people like Jefferson, although le I think less from Jefferson in that way. But I think you know Madison and the people working on education at the time really do say, and James Wilson is, is maybe a little bit more interesting here. He has these you know, long lectures on law and he um, is both brilliant and also in, you know, his writing can just be incredibly pretentious and you know, hard to work through even though it's also you know, stunning. Um, and it's way that he gives these famous law lectures and you know, we're in the audience is George Washington and, and um, the like, it, it, what becomes the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And he actually is working out kind of freedom of mind as it relates to um, educational institutions and Republican government more broadly. And so you do, I mean, you do have hints of it that are what we would think of as really distinctly modern. That is, that it's not just that you are allowed wide criticism of the government, but that the government's in no place to police your thoughts. So that you, you know, it doesn't matter if you are a Marxist or, you know, a Nazi trying to march, if you're engaged in thought that's deeply critical of not just the government in power, but the entire system, that that's of course preserved within the Republican scheme. But again, that, it's really kind of in its early stages, I would say, um, at this period. But I mean, it, you know, it's, and it's one of those things that again, kind of plays out, um, you know, across the century. And, and then the catch is, um, we often agree in principle on these things, you know, whether it's within the government or even deeply critical of the government, the catch is when you know, some event from the outside happens that makes us suddenly worried that this speech might have um, genuine consequences. That's when you seem to see the, you know, potential stepping away from principles and, uh, and silencing of speech. Although I would, I would say that hasn't, since about the late 60s, that really hasn't, I don't think that there's been much silencing um, along those lines in America, at least for those reasons. Michelle Goodwin uh, wrote and, and uh, followed up on Anne's question as well, a little bit about freedom of speech on college campuses, which has yeah. been an issue recently. And uh, Michelle um, mentioned your colleague John Shield's book, Passing on the Right, yeah. and how education has shifted what freedom of speech is by shifting education of our youth. So kind of some comments on, on that and, and free speech on campus. Yeah, so, what, so wait, what was Anne's question? I missed that then. Oh, uh, it's hard to scroll. She just says Republican conservative speakers on campus that cannot speak freely. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that's a, that's a great question. Actually, and I'm, I should say, I'm, I'll tell John that his book was plugged. I'm about to have a meeting with him, properly social distanced, um, shortly after this. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that's one of the real challenges um, of, I mean, taking freedom of speech seriously, whether it's with regard to political opinions um, you know, or regard to a much broader set of issues, the kind of issues we're, you know, entertain on 
college campuses, um, allowing people to speak who you just profoundly disagree with. And I mean, the real catch, I think, comes when you think that they're doing genuine harm. I mean, to, you know, put the good spin or, you know, at least, you know, try to be empathetic to the Federalists. I mean, the, the Federalists didn't just want to put the screws to their critics. I mean, I think there was some of that. And yes, Adams was vain and pompous and all that and just couldn't stand to be criticized. But there were also really people who thought that these Republicans were, you know, embracing a French Revolution that was going to undermine uh, America. And so, I mean, I think that's, you know, when you really think it could be harmful, um, and th those who want to deplatform, especially um, conservative speakers um, on college campuses, are, you know, I mean, trying to do it because I think they think that there's actually genuine harm that comes out of it. I mean, I also think that there's some that we just don't want to hear um, those opinions and they have no place. So let's silence them for those reasons. But I think, I mean, I think uh, Shields does a terrific job, um, you know, working through that and how, you know, how do we, and I mean, he, what I would say is he's a really a model for, I think colleges, the open academy and the like, because he um, in his, you know, courses actually has students take on in his culture work courses, he takes on the issues that are, you know, most pressing um, on us where we disagree most profoundly and the students, you know, spend one week reading, you know, one important author and then, you know, the next week reading somebody who disagrees precisely um, with them on those issues. And I think that's, that's the kind of model. And so, I, I mean, I, what I would say on college campuses um, is, you know, being more tolerant and more open to speech that you disagree with is really part of um, not just the educational mission, but it really kind of spills over into the political world. Because part of, I think, what's happening is we're isolating on, you know, not just campuses, but in our you know, so-called private lives, but then that spills over to public. And that's why we then view some of the people as not just people we disagree with, but as, you know, you know, the enemy. We have one final question from Brian. Brian, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. And thank you very much. This was a fascinating talk. And I have a few questions, but I think there are quick ones for you. Uh, were any of the Jeffersonian Republicans prosecuted? is one. Another one is, was this really seen as a, a new idea to have freedom of speech that was this thorough? So did the founders, the ones who favored the free speech and opposed the Sedition Act, did they look to the UK with the differences that you already talked about as kind of the, what they were starting from, or did they look to Athens or the Roman Republic? Uh, another one was how thorough were the Jeffersonian Republicans in free speech, would they really favor free speech as we kind of see it in the last 30 or 40 years? I had a professor who uh, I think was prosecuted for not taking an oath that was required back in the 19, you know, 50s or 60s. And I think those were fairly common even up until that era. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, you know, I got they, a couple more. <laughs> you know, those, are, those are great questions. Um, in, in terms of um, the first one, I mean, this is where the Sedition Act looks most political. No, no, uh, it was all Republicans who were prosecuted and no Federalists were prosecuted. So Federalists could said, essentially say anything they wanted about Republican government officials. Think of those lines I read you that were at least as defamatory, right? Blood drinking cannibals and the like um, as the critics of Adams. None of them were prosecuted. Um, and in fact, that you know, the, the the most obvious kind of tell in this regard is that you could criticize the vice president, who was Thomas Jefferson, all you wanted um, and never get prosecuted, um, right? He wasn't even actually named under the Sedition Act. I mean, so that was kind of the obvious um, political bias that it was really meant to go after Republicans and protect uh, high Federalists. And, and the second question, I think, I mean, it's a great question. It kind of builds on uh, Brian Davidson's question in his way. And, and I mean, what I would say is you through the through the 18th century, yeah, there are actually a lot of uh, understandings put forward, um, especially by Whig political thinkers in the UK that are very much working out these kinds of arguments for freedom of speech and really about freedom of speech, especially being able to criticize those in, who are wielding political power. Um, and you know, as early as the the very you know first couple decades of uh, the 18th century, you even have uh, a, you know, a famous uh, writer, Cato, um, 
who you know writes in the the British popular press and political press that lots of the Americans will later really draw on, um, and those arguments are kind of being played out, and so it's it's really kind of in flux because you have those arguments even in the United Kingdom, and they certainly are around with the state constitutions that are formed before the American Constitution. Um, but alongside those, you have really kind of the much more limited. Um, understanding, especially in the work of, say, somebody like William Blackstone, the you know famous um, British jurist uh, and thinker on the common law, who has a much narrower view. And so, I mean, that, you know, I think that that's being worked out on on the, and it takes really more than a century, right? And in some sense, we're still kind of working these out. I mean, the, the questions about what we do on college campuses are great questions that are you know confronting us with new issues to push us to think how we deal with these. On the Jefferson question, I think you're probably right. The loyalty oath um, is, you know, a really important one, and there's a, and that's one where freedom of speech really, really gets uh, touchy. And it's not clear that that, you know, a Jeffersonian understanding early on would have said, "Oh, go ahead and refuse to sign a loyalty oath," uh, but you can still work at the uh, university. Although you didn't have to sign one at the University of Virginia, um, when and and Jefferson actually was, you know the rector for a while and Madison for a while. So, you know, I mean, it, they don't make clear arguments about that, but I think it's a great question to think about. Wonderful, thank you. All right, and that is all the time we have for today. I know Professor Thomas has a family and has classes to teach. Uh, thank Gilles. you all. I'm gonna unmute all of you shortly. You can say hi and thank uh, George Thomas uh, directly. If you have further questions, of course, feel free to send an email or even follow up on this. Uh, when we going to meet everybody uh, if we have a few minutes here. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Salvatore Center, go to www.salvatorycenter.org. Of course, please follow up on our Open Academy initiative to make sure that uh, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression uh, is preserved on the CMC campus. And don't forget to make your uh, end of year gift before June 30 uh, and support CMC students during this uh, time of crisis. So thank you all. I'm unmuting you. The embassy would not say let you hi, make, say bye. they wouldn't thank issue you, a visa. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> thanks, Thank everyone. <laughs> thanks, Professor Thomas. Oh, thanks for purchases. I just muted. Yes. <laughs> Tell Claire hello. <laughs> we will. Did you read her thesis yet? I'm way through. <laughs> Have you? Good stuff. Yes. <laughs> More than <laughs> once now. <laughs> Awesome. Good to see you guys. Thanks for all your help. I can't believe she's a senior. Where'd the time go? All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>